Welcome back to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now, many of you have heard that James Brown was the hardest working man in show business, right? Well, today, I've got the hardest working man in public service here, and that would be Michael <laughs> Curry, who wears several hats. Um, he's the president of the Boston chapter of the NAACP. He sits on their national board. I'll let him talk to you about his day job, the one that really takes care of him <laughs> and, his, and his family uh, in health care. But Michael is a guy who really gets the job done and is really looking out for you and I and making sure that what we need uh, insofar as citizens of the Commonwealth is really tended to. So, Michael, thank you so much uh, for coming on. I really appreciate you. it. Thank you. And, I, and, 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 you know, you can attest to it. I kid you not when I say this brother is one of the hardest working men out I don't there. know if I can compete with James you know, Brown, though. <laughs> well, no, you know, he's got you on the screen, right? He got you on the screen. He got paid to Yeah, right now, right? But you got everything else. <laughs> Listen, man. Talk to me about, you know, the state of a black Boston kind of with this whole Ferguson, Baltimore thing as a backdrop. Yeah, it's, it's a uh, interesting conversation, right, whether the glass is half empty or half full. I think <laughs> when you look at the underlying issues in Ferguson and Baltimore, quite frankly, in Cleveland and yeah. throughout the country, right. Those underlying issues are here as well. You know, we're twice as unemployed as the rest of the city, as the rest of the state. Um, we are dealing with chronic unemployment that is generational, that yeah. is a direct result of a history of a neglect uh, and lack of access. Um, we're dealing with the health disparities that have us dying and suffering longer. You know, all the, the formula for the, the unrest that we see in the rest of the country is here. Uh, the police abuse, um, you know, I've often had to explain even, and I have a great relationship with Commissioner Evans and Chief Gross and the other leadership, that, you know, they inherited a, a, a culture that there are officers that can violate the rights of people in communities of color and that that conversation needs to happen, that that's been historically true, mm -hmm. that you didn't need, you, you needed reasonable suspicion, but you didn't necessarily need it on the street and that mm -hmm. you could arrest someone with probable cause. And, and fabricate sort of the, the events of the interaction. That's happening across the country. It doesn't mean all cops do it. It means that there is a bad culture in much of our law enforcement and there are bad practices and bad people. And I think that we have a great conversation here, yeah. um, which I would call us the best of the worst, right? Yeah. We're better than many other cities, right. but we got work to do too. Right. So when uh, the new mayor came in, Marty Walsh came in, he did yeoman's work with the command staff and making that representative of the city. In further conversations with other folks, though, it's been brought to my attention that as you drill down into the rank and file, right. that's not necessarily the case. Have you had those discussions with Commissioner Evans and, and, and so on, so forth, about how we bring up the numbers of folk of color? Right. Yeah, we talk about it often. Um, you know, I think a lot of the work, when, and you know this, because you've done advocacy for years, even prior to being sheriff, you know that much of the conversation you have with people are behind the scenes because you're trying to work them, present policy changes, talk through what their impediments are to getting to that. We meet with this commissioner and this chief probably at least every two, three weeks. Oh, uh, we're texting okay. each other okay. around issues. Every time there was an incident in Cleveland or Ferguson nice. or Baltimore, the commissioner and or the superintendent and chief are texting me sort of their feedback. And we're talking about the implications for Boston. When it comes to diversity within BPD, we're nowhere near where we need to be. Right. I know that we have the most diverse command staff we've ever had in history. I know that that would not have happened under the previous administration, right. and that it is a testament to this commissioner that's happening. However, our job is to push them further than that. Right. The reality is, is if your leadership is now diverse, many of them will be retiring over the next few years, and if your cadet class is 99% white male, uh, whether it's the veterans preference, whether it's, um, you know, the civil service exam, whatever those impediments are, the pipeline is a white male pipeline. Mm -hmm. That's something we should all be concerned about. And therefore, the criticism and the, the urgency is there for us. And I express it to them every time we get So I got a two-part question for you. Reference we, and I, I want to know who we is outside of yourself. But yep. before we get there, I want to touch on the test, the civil servants test, because right. I've heard a lot about that test. Is it skewed? away from folk of color in a way that it's hard for folk of color to pass that test? Or is it a situation where folk of color need to have some sort of different tutorial process to get around, you know, whatever that obstacle may be so that they can pass the test? 
So I think the champions in, in, in this city on the civil service exam over the many years has been um, MAMLEO, mm -hmm. uh, the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers. Yep. They've been the champion on changing the test. Quite frankly, they've been successful in that under Mayor Menino and the former police commissioner, Davis, there was an effort to put up, I think it was $2 million into looking at alternatives to the civil service exam. And there was some work done. Alternative with, not to take the test at all? To, no, meaning an alternative exam. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So yep, there's yep. been some conversation right, that right. recognizes <clears throat> that there may be some reason to go to a different model. You know, I leave that as their space. I think that there's, uh, there's lawsuits, there's conversations around that exam. Quite frankly, I'd love to at some point turn our attention to getting a, a, a group of folks ready for whatever exam exists. I know the Urban League used to do that. They used to have people come in, prepare for the exam, and then get them ready. Yeah. So I think it's a mix of, a, a mix of both. I, identify a better exam model that's not an impediment. Deal with the seniority issues that, quite frankly, just positions the white male officers who traditionally had access and we didn't. Right. And then also deal with the prep issues to get us ready to take the exam. I think it's all, all of the tools in the tool belt to make sure that we get diversity. Now, when you say we, are making sure that we're pushing and pushing hard. Who's we? What is that group of folks? So sometimes, and, and this is the, the disturbing part about Boston sometimes, but it's, it's national too, is that we often work in silos and for whatever reasons we can't all within the black community or communities of color come together and, and fight together on these issues. But however, you know, I compare it to a symphony, right? Mm -hmm. That we may all have different entrance, I, I, instruments, but we're all kind of leading to the same place. So whether it's MAMLEO and the work that they're doing around diversity, around um, the disparate disciplinary policy within BPD that right. has historically been true to, right, right. Um, or if it's the Urban League and the work that we're doing together around diversity, the disciplinary policy, and quite frankly, individual incidents as we come across them, we get it right on the phone. There was a recent case of a police officer who intimidated a guy on the street videotaping with their the arrest with the gun. Yeah. Walked up, put the gun yeah. in his in the videographer's face. Mm -hmm. um, I immediately got on, this is a Facebook post, I immediately called Chief Gross and the commissioner and said, hey, take a look at Facebook. This is disturbing. They thought it was disturbing. They pulled the officer in. They're disciplining the officer. And then we got a chance to bring the officer and the, the gentleman, the African-American gentleman that was taping it, together at our office, the NAACP, with Darnell Williams at Urban League, right. Reverend Dickerson on the phone, and okay. some others. And we talked about it. And quite frankly, Sheriff, some of this stuff can be handled with an apology and a recognition that it was the wrong thing. That's right. right now, we've become so polarized That's that right. no one wants to admit That's that right. it was a bad arrest. That's right. Right, right, um, right, right. And, you know, you still get penalized for what you did, but at least you may have staved off a lawsuit or the contention or the, the public distrust that happens. Mm -hmm. Is the clergy involved? Clergy's involved, yeah. I, and I, our city councilors. Now, our city councilors of color, have they answered the call? They have. I think, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the overwhelming part about this work is that, and, I, and I, I'm not a judgment person. I sit, when I think about the work you do, right, right. I know that the work that you're doing around mass incarceration and making sure that folks got reentry, that I don't expect you to always be at the, the health disparities meeting. Right, right. <laughs> How about that, right? Right, because you got about a thousand Dude, other meetings to go to. We don't to even want to go there right there, right? So I try to remember <laughs> that, you know, whether it's um, Councillor Presley uh, or Councillor Jackson or Zakem or the rest yeah. of those folks or Sonia, yep. uh, Senator Chang Diaz or Senator Forey and the rest of those folks, that they have so much. I call on them when we can do something together. Right, and right, yes, right. they're plugged into the commissioner. They're plugged into BPD. And quite frankly, I think, you know, we're all fighting the fight. We just got to try to coordinate the strategy better. So l let me segue a little bit now and talk about what you're doing for the national board of the NAACP. And, well, first of all, tell us, what, what do you do on the national board? What is that? Yeah, I know, <laughs> well, right? How much time I'm, you got, I'm right? laughing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm laughing because now it's a little bit of everything. So, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the newbie. Right. The young, younger guy. Right. And that's why, is every, that's why so they give it all to you. I'm on six yeah. committees. Right, right. Can you believe that? Six committees. No. So right. I'm doing the constitutional review. So I'm looking at the whole constitution that we're governed by in the NAACP, and I'm proposing changes to sort of bring us up to date Whoa. on our Constitution, which is huge. Whoa. I'm sitting at the table yeah, that's crazy. with legends in yeah. civil rights. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing the Voting Rights Act. So we're, uh, I'm on two committees, civic engagement and legislation, that's looking at restoring the Voting Rights Act. You know that the yeah. Supreme Court gutted some of the provisions that held states and counties accountable. And we're looking at filing, you know, supporting legislation and moving an agenda to restore the Voting Rights Act. 
I'm on the Image Awards Committee, so I get to participate in the Image Awards every year. Oh, cool, cool. cool, uh, cool. I'm on the legal committee for the yeah, NAACP, so I'm in the mix on the legal issues. Yeah. Uh, and about three other committees, the Convention Planning Committee. You know, it reminds me of that commercial years ago, Give It to Mikey. Give you know, it to Mikey. Give it to Mikey. Give it to Mikey. Give it yeah. to Mikey. He's got uh, it. You, you know, know, it's funny. I'm, you, you and I said this before. I got to learn how to say no. You got to say no. Bro. But I will say, though, that, you know, life is short. And I yeah. do look at it as a blessing. When I'm sitting in meetings next to Julian Bond, yeah. the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the legend in civil rights, right. and we're in meetings talking Voter Rights Act, yeah. or I'm with, in the room with Crump yeah. on yeah. criminal justice issues, yeah. Yeah. who represented you know, the families in many of the most recent cases. Yeah. I'm humbled yeah. to oh, be in absolutely. the room. Absolutely. So that's probably why I haven't said no, yeah. but I think I'm at that You're getting point. close. But right. I'll tell you what, though, Michael, and I've known you for a long time, and I'm not blowing smoke at you. Um, I, I understand you're being humbled, and you should be. That said, when you talk about that new vanguard, that young vanguard, mm -hmm. that next wave of practitioners like yourself and others mm -hmm. in this generation yeah. that we occupy, it's your time. Yeah. You see? You. It's your time to get out there because, I mean, you've, got, you've done the groundwork. You've laid the foundation. Now you've got to build on it. But I want to go back to what you said about the Voting Rights Act. It blows my mind. I mean, mm -hmm. just absolutely, unequivocally blows my mind that any state municipality would even like deign to say this person shouldn't vote or this person needs this ID and that. Right. To, uh, right. What? Right. I mean, this is like almost going back to like the 19th century, you know, early 20. Michael, I don't understand it, man. Can you can you bring some clarity to how these folks could even get their back up to do this? To yeah, us? it's funny because it, it is race, right? So one layer of it is, is race, and then there's an overlay of politics, which okay. you and I both know uh -huh. very well, both yep. of those those spaces. And sometimes we don't understand the difference between the two. So politics is, if you're talking party politics, too many people showed up to vote in 08 and 12. And there is a political strategy that says, we need some of those people who showed up in 08 and 12 not to show not up. Show up. Okay. So it is, it, that is not rocket science, right? It's, it's political strategy. Right. And some states, some governors, some uh, counties have decided that the way to keep them from showing up is to put impediments. Now, we know that this right. democracy, we always say democracy shouldn't be this hard. The goal is to get as many of us to vote as possible, not to restrict it, to get less of us to exactly. vote. And quite frankly, right. for voter IDs and restrictions on voter registration, um, there is very little abuse uh, within the system. That is proven that there's very little voter, uh, voter fraud with vote, uh, fake IDs. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. It is basically a solution for a problem that doesn't exist and that we need to raise the public consciousness because you might listen to it on TV and your sort of intuition says, well, no, IDs make sense. But you don't know that that's going to keep your cousin Right. your cousin and them right. from voting because right. the largest segment of communities that don't have IDs are poor communities, communities of color. And what, elderly or no? And elderly as well. Okay. Right. So, you know, this reminds me, and, 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 you know, we all do a lot of public speaking, and oftentimes when I'm standing in front of folks, I talk about the need to have civics reintroduced to the school system. Absolutely. You know, when you take civics away, go back two, two and a half, three decades and extrapolate that going forward, it's almost no wonder why people don't fully understand a couple of things. Community and how community works, how right. community works with government, how right. community works with policing, and the power of the vote, mm -hmm. you know? And so I've talked to people, younger people, Actually, some old people, frankly, and they just don't have an understanding, right. Michael. And it's just, right. I look at that, and I remember it was, it was called civic, uh, social studies when we were kids, right. but that was that program, that course that taught you about how you have community engagement. Right. You know, and yeah. I think it's, I think it's tragic it, that it, it's gone. It is tragic, and you know, I, and I'm, you know, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist about it, but I'm a historian on this stuff, and I believe that it, that's not unintentional either. Yeah. Right. You know, a generation oh. ago, we were struggling for the right to vote. You know, we were struggling for access to unions and yeah. jobs. Yeah. So the reality is we're in a situation where people don't view the system as ours. So we have to find, find a way to crack that code of ignorance that says, you know what, my vote doesn't matter. Yeah. You know right, what? Exactly. They're going to do what they want to do no matter. You've heard your uncles I and aunts that's and right. grandparents yeah. say that yeah. over the course of the years. Like, you know, they're going to do what they want to do right. anyway. Right. right. So we got to get into them and say, you know what, if the black population of Boston showed up to vote in any election, and we're not even telling you how to vote, just show up and vote. Yeah. You could transform the city's landscape in terms of political representation, in terms of issues. That's right. There now is a civil uh, right. uh, civilian review board. There now is body cams. There now is 
a special prosecutor. There now is data collection around police engagement. Right. This is part of your 10-point justice plan? All, all of the justice plan and right. all the civil rights organizations uh -huh. post, I mean, really dating back before Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown have been advocating for years. Now the the national attention, now we're all, you know, all of these legal pundits sitting in front of T CNN right now. Now people understand all these key terms. Yeah. We now need to turn that into showing up at a city, city council or state legislative hearing and now voting. I think, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm kind of that glass half full guy and I'm an eternal optimist. I think that's going to probably happen for a variety of reasons, but principally, you can't have as many young black and brown men shot down, dead, with such consistency yep. before people just say, enough. Right. You know, it's, it's enough. So, I, you know, part of that is what happened in Baltimore. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, they, uh, the folks down there destroyed parts of their own neighborhood. Right. I will say this, though. The next day, two days later, there were people that in that neighborhood went out yeah. to clean that up right. that called CVS to say, hey, don't move out of the neighborhood. Right. We want you Capture here. This. I, I, I <laughs> thought that was great because if you remember, you know, well, Watts, we were really young. But, you know, yeah. Watts and, and other riots, yeah. those places remain. There's parts of Philadelphia and other places that still look like... What it looked like, you know, going back into the 60s. And that's in part if the people that live there just say, you know what, let me pick up a broom mm -hmm. and a pan mm -hmm. and clean this up myself. Yeah. It shows the nation that, okay, that went off the rails, but we're going to take care of ourselves. Yeah. We're going to police ourselves. And we need more of that, you mm -hmm. know. It's very interesting, uh, Miss Mosley down in, in Baltimore. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, she ran on a platform of checking the police, right? right? right. Um, she was given money by the Fraternal Order of Police for her campaign. <laughs> and then when this thing blew up, oh, it's <laughs> a surprise. Exactly. <laughs> she's calling, she's checking exactly. the police. Not right? a shock. Right. And I, I don't mean to laugh because it's not a funny situation, but yeah. she said, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. You know? And I, it, it takes courage to do that work. I think ultimately, tons. ultimately she's being criticized now for sort of the, um, the administrative stuff around how she brought the charges, the True. timing of when she brought the right. charges. Ultimately, it's the same thing I say to Dan Conley here, yeah. that I say to Commissioner Evans here, that I say to Mayor Walsh here, that this stuff requires courage, right? Because yeah. it is, the system is inherently flawed. So I, I use the example in law enforcement. If I come and I arrest someone and I don't have reasonable suspicion or I don't have probable cause to right. arrest them, right. so to stop them or to arrest them, then I can make up a phrase and say, you know, if, if I have to shoot them, I say, well, I felt threatened. They're reaching in their wallet. And in almost every case, as long as your threat perception says that you reasonably perceive threat, right. is justified. I'm not saying that that's, I can't argue that that's 5% or 50% of the cases. The problem is that it is, exists. Yeah. And that we need to come together and have an honest conversation. And Mosby was willing to say, hey, we need to hold him accountable. Let the process start. Right. Let right. a jury, right. Let, right. Let, let the grand jury process right. kick in, right. and then let's figure out what right. all of this is. And I think all too often our politicians are afraid yeah. to initiate the process because, quite frankly, that old saying that you and I have talked about before, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. Yeah. If you're not the woman who's the prosecutor, then you're not going to hold them a, a, accountable for sex trafficking and, exactly. and violent crimes against women. If you're not exactly. a person of color That's in right. the table, then you That's can't right. say, wait a minute. Right. This one does rise to the level of right. bringing charges for me. Right. Unfortunately, we have a society that very few people are at the table that ref reflect us, and therefore the outcome is what it is. Well, if you look at what's happening politically here in Boston and probably hopefully in, in other major urban cities, I don't know, out in the hinterland so much, but there are a lot of young folk of color getting into the process. Getting They, they yep. want to be representatives. They want to get out there and have their voices heard and work for the people, right. you know? And so Mosley may have been a little, Miss Mosley may have been a little quick, but a couple of things. One, she was decisive. Right. Two, um, it really did serve to quiet down mm -hmm. what was really boiling, you know. And so everybody said, like, oh, damn, wow, that was a surprise. We didn't mm -hmm. expect this to happen or to happen that fast. So let me give her a chance now. Let me step back now. Mm -hmm. Now then the question became, well, she may have overreached, right. you know, and she right. may not get them all. But you know what? She may not get them all. Mm -hmm. But what she did was she saved her community a lot of, of I think, turmoil and heartache. And like you said, let the process begin now. Yeah. And we see where it goes. But I also think that that should be an example for the next case like this that will pop up. And you, it, it's un, it's, it, it almost hurts to say that will pop up, but you almost think that it will pop up. You know, the, the contradictions abound in this stuff that just frustrates me. And of course, as we see the national conversation play out, the reality is 
prosecutors have overreached for generations, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, I always think about Central Park Five. Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they arrested yeah. and prosecuted five boys for something they didn't do. Right. And there was all kind of overreaching in that, yeah, right. right? There was all kind of fabricating right. evidence and, and filling in the blanks. Yep. And, and That's not new. That's not, uh, you know, it's always different when somebody else does it, yeah, right? Yeah, it's always yeah, now, it's like, oh, yeah, wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. You're not a good attorney. You're yeah. not a good prosecutor. There have been historically cases that we can all go back and peel open and say, you know what, this was not a good prosecution. Yeah. And the reality is, let's have that conversation around the system not being fair generally, you know, occasionally, and then we could say, okay, well, maybe she could have brought these charges and that reasonable people can disagree on whether there was enough evidence there exactly. to do it. Exactly. You know, when you talk about community and policing and the two coming together, um, clearly we need police. I mean, right. in, I mean, every 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 jurisdiction municipality, we need police. Yeah. The question is, how do they comport themselves, and how do they interact with the people that they are paid to serve? Right. And so, if we can get to a point where, you know, and you referenced Boston earlier being the best of a bad kind of situation, mm -hmm. but if we can get to a situation where we communities and policing can come together and do what they're both supposed to do with respect, right? Then I think that really helps society out a whole bunch. I mean, clearly, I, I know I'm speaking, you know, I'm saying the things that are obvious, but until we have people that will roll up their sleeves and do this in a sustainable way. See, Michael, mm -hmm. we've all been at this, the one and done, the one off meetings, you know, <laughs> oh, you know, had the big meeting and it was great, right. blah, 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 blah. And then what happened? And we're back here again. Right. You know, nothing <laughs> happens. We have to do it. And what I tell folks is I say, hold the sheriff's department accountable, but you got to do it every day. Yeah. Every day. Every day you got to hold us accountable because if you don't and things slide, you know, look, we're going to do what we have to do to serve the municipalities that we govern, but you have to stay in the mix, you know. Credit to you, though, Sheriff, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a story that has been told about, you know, the shift that's happened in the sheriff's department with your predecessor, Sheriff Cabral, and then with you, you know, there may there were complaints about the sheriff's county, yeah. uh, sheriff's yeah. department. Yeah. And quite frankly, I know that you came in with the right compass around how do we get people in here, serve them while they're here, right. get them ready to come out, and treat them with some degree of respect while they're here, right. especially if they have substance abuse issues and other things that's that we right. need to address. That's right. You've done that, but yeah. that's what we need in the court system. That's what we need right. in the state police. That's that right. we need in that's the local right. police. That's right. And unfortunately. And, and quite frankly, Judge Harris says this. That's what we need on the bench, yeah, right? Right. Because some of these people come with their own prejudice, preconceived notions, and one of us represents all of us. That's, That's why right. when when they were rioting in Baltimore, I had to remind my white colleagues. I said, you know, y'all rioted after your team lost, right? Right. And 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 those people rioting after Kentucky lost didn't That's represent true. you. That's right. That's right? right. Those were That's some true. knuckleheads right. and some people That's who were upset. Yeah, you know what? And quite That's frankly. Yeah. You know, we have people, Roxbury, yeah. 1968, people get mad and, and quite frankly, they feel unempowered and don't know That's how right. That's right. to express their anger and they throw a can through the trash, the trench can through right. the building. Right. It's not right, but there's an explanation. Yeah. There, right. You might not have an excuse, but there's an explanation and it behooves us to figure it out before the next riot. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because people said to me, so why, why would they destroy their neighborhoods? Right. OK. <laughs> valid point. But they destroy their neighborhoods and it's a bad, bad, bad thing to do. Right. But they're breathing the next day. Right. right. Go to someone else's neighborhood and right. try that. You know, right. go downtown yeah. and try that right. and see what happens. And quite no, frankly, they probably didn't own anything they destroyed know, anyway. Right. Exactly. So. You know, but although there were a number of black businesses in Baltimore, right. you know, or employees of businesses that were of color that, that are now case. out of work. Right. You know, right. and so that's a bad thing. So folks have to you look can't at that. You can justify that. No, it's not. No. That is not a good thing. Yeah. But there's a. You know, uh, Dr. King has that famous quote about, you know, riots being the, I don't even remember the, the exact quote, but it, there's a reason for it that yeah. people get to that point. Yeah. We're ignorant to figuring it out. And yeah. I'm hoping that Baltimore, Ferguson just awakens That's right. Awakens That's right. Story. So people now, when if the next one happens, people say, okay, really bad, but let's not riot. Right. Let's figure, let's find our Miss Mosby. Right. Mostly, and Absolutely. figure this one out. Hey, man, we're out of time, Mike. I got to have you back again, man. Thank you, know, you. Whenever you come up for air, brother, you know, <laughs> we didn't even get to talk about, you know, what you do with the community health centers and all. Yeah. So we got to get you back to talk about that because one of the things that we're looking real quickly at the sheriff's department is we've been talking to the community health centers about coming in, yes. matching them up with, with the inmate population four to six months before they leave. Right. So that as they exit, they they've got to help. They've got it. Boom. It's yeah. done. And so they can make a warm call versus a cold call. Yes. But Love brother, it. Thank right. you so much for yeah. coming. Thank man. you for really all you do, Sheriff. Thank you. Hey, man, this is what we're supposed to do.
Right. All right, folks, look, we're uh, out of time. We're out of here. We'll be back again next week. Until then, you take care of yourself. Peace.